Hello, I'm Barbara Ash, National Director of the Veteran Institute for Procurement, and I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for this VIP webinar, How to Leverage an Acquisition to Accelerate Growth. This webinar was developed with the goal to help veteran businesses accelerate growth in the federal marketplace. And that is what VIP is all about, accelerating the success of veteran-owned small business government contractors. And it is working. On average, companies grow 64% just one year after graduation from the VIP program. VIP offers three different curriculums to give veteran-owned small businesses the tools they need to win government contracts. Programs are held in the Washington, D.C. area, just 11 miles from the White House. Participants receive hands-on market-based instruction that helps establish best business practices for federal government contracting, and the program is offered at no cost. We currently offer VIP Grow, our core curriculum, VIP Start for veteran-owned small businesses looking to become procurement ready, and then VIP expanded its curriculum in 2017 and now offers VIP International to accelerate veteran small business success in the global marketplace. This webinar series is made possible thanks to the support of the United States Small Business Administration. Its goal for this webinar and for the, the whole series of webinars is to provide resources to the 22 veteran business outreach centers located throughout the country that support veteran-owned government contractors with entrepreneurial development services, such as business training, counseling, and mentoring. And these webinars are also a resource for the VIP alumni to ensure their continued success in the federal marketplace. The slides and audio from this webinar will be made available on the VIP website at nationalvip.org. It is now my pleasure to introduce a leader in her field, Erin Andrew, Managing Director for Government Contracting with Live Oak Bank. Erin Andrew joined Live Oak Bank with over six years at the United States Small Business Administration. Most recently, she was Associate Administrator for Capital Access where she oversaw the agency's lending efforts that included 100 billion of government loan programs for small businesses. She is also a project management professional and a Kaufman Fellow of the Class of 20. Prior to posting at SBA, Erin held positions as the Assistant Administrator for the SBA's Office of Women Business Ownership, where she oversaw the agency's efforts to promote the growth of women-owned businesses. She was also director of the Innovation Clusters and Skills Initiatives in the SBA's Office of Entrepreneurial Development, where she worked to meet counseling and training needs for small businesses. It is now my pleasure to introduce Erin Andrew. Thank you, Erin, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Barb. Um, I'm excited to be here, and first and foremost, I wanted to thank everyone on the call for your service um, and commitment to our country. Um, continue to be in awe of folks who, um, you know, spend their time and decide to dedicate their lives to, to our country. So just thank you for that. I'm an Army wife. My husband is out of the Army now, but I know it is not easy, and so I just appreciate everything that everyone has done. Um, I want to get started, and I want to start by giving you uh, some general small business contracting trends that we've seen specifically in the service-disabled veteran-owned small business market. Um, and then I'll go into some tools that we think are helpful as you look to grow within the gov government space. So let's go ahead and take us uh, to the next slide. Okay, great. So as you can see here, the overall SDVOSB allocation across the federal government has you know, increased. We're still seeing the returns on 2018, the end of fiscal year, and we see a lot of the reporting, but these are prime government dollars in the SDVOSB space. So we've seen a significant increase. Obviously, you know, making that 3% goal is, 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 is incredibly important to every agency, and I know they all strive to continue to do that, but we're lucky to see the focus on small businesses that has occurred over the course of the last five years, and we hope that that just continues into the future. 
especially those in the SDVOSB space. When you take a look at the next slide in terms of agency spending, the majority of the SDVOSB work has gone, you know, is come from, excuse me, DOD and the VA, which is not a, is not surprising. Um, we've seen a little, you know, we've seen increases, and you see a little bit of a dive on DOD in 2018. Usually, we see a bit of a delay in terms of reporting for prime contracts. So hopefully, by once everything's kind of rectified um, towards the end of this calendar year, you'll see, you know, an uptick a bit more in the 2018 timeframe. Um, and then also, we I want to look at the breakdown of NAICS codes for SDVOSB spending as well, because I think this is incredibly telling, and you can see where the work is being done. Um, generally, and that's the next slide. And generally, we see the majority of the work in the 236-220 commercial and institutional building construction space. However, in the 541 NAICS codes, um, and it's not up on the screen yet, but you'll probably see it in a minute. 541, 519, 541, 330 engineering services, um, 541, 611 NAICS codes. Um, also a lot of spend in the S for SDVOSB set aside. Um, and I would say in the 541 NAICS codes, with the exception of the 541-611, but 541-519, for example, um, it's a lot of opportunity because not only is generally that higher margin work, but it's also higher um, size max, the 27.5 million size max within that NAICS code. Um, and I think, are we, is there a bit of a delay on the, on the slides? Great. There the, so there are the NAICS codes that you can see the breakdown. Um, and this is prime, um, prime government spend, just so you can see where the dollars are being obligated. So I want to transition now and talk a little bit about the keys to successful growth. And I think we hear often, and, I, and it's incredibly important, I know my time at SBA, we worked with, counseled, and trained um, and provided financing to help counsel and you know help with the counseling and training of a lot of small businesses. And organic growth within the federal government is is critical and it's it's an important thing to focus on. But something that we think is a valuable tool to be aware of um, is acquisition. And we're going to talk a little bit about this on the webinar today. Um, and but I want to kind of set the stage. So when you look at past performance, and there have been studies, Grant Thornton does a study on this, the majority of work generally goes to the incumbent. Past performance is king. And if you look at just the contracting officers, that um, that series, there's, you know, there are retirement age, a lot of folks are hitting retirement age. So there are fewer and fewer contracting officers and more of a demand and need for more contracting officers, but the work is not, you know, slowing down. So the ability to, you know, compete and, and put out work, uh, it can be stressful. Um, and it also is difficult um, for contracting officers to do a lot of, you know, new awards um, given the time they have. So they look for opportunities through the set-aside program, small business set-asides, and generally speaking, oftentimes there is um, you know, there is a focus on maintaining work with the, with the incumbent. Um, if, the, if the work is good, they know the folks on the ground, in the agency, they trust those folks, and that incumbent has, you know, obviously the past performance um, with the work and within that agency. So um, I think that's something we've been looking at from a trend perspective. Um, if you look at different agencies, and we have this data across all agencies, but it, it you know, at SBA, 80% of the time the work goes to the incumbent. At USDA, it's 90% of the time. At HHS, it's 94% of the time. Um, and it's anywhere from about 54% to 77% based on year-to-year -year data um, from Grant Thornton in terms of where that work is going. So it's just something to keep in mind when you look at where things are within the government right now. I want to drill down to the next slide on agency 8A spend. Um, I realize that you know we've got you know a lot of SDVOSBs on the phone. Probably some of you are 8A companies as well. 
But it's important to understand, you know, the 8A program can provide you the opportunity to obviously win a lot of work organically. But if you're an 8A company trying to get into certain agencies, there is still, you know, it's, it can be difficult if you're not the incumbent. So breaking down by agency, 9.4 billion is available from DOD to 8A companies, like that was in 2017, but only 6% went to new companies. So you're able to win a lot of work once you're in, but getting in can be the challenge. Um, 1.5 billion in HHS, um, 919 million, um, it, you know, some of the other agencies. So I think it's important to really think about how you're getting into agencies and what are strategies to do that. And sometimes it's through the mentor protege program, teaming, um, and other times it's it's contemplating an acquisition to gain that past performance. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. The other thing that's important to contemplate is the diversification across agencies. And I've heard you know, when you look in the small business space, especially, once you're in an agency, you can go to a lot of different, you know, program offices within that agency. But what the data has shown, and we do a lot of analysis on prime contract data for small businesses, that companies that picked up one additional agency just from the 2016 fiscal year to 2017 saw roughly a half a million dollars increase in obligated dollars on average. So diversification does matter. And how you get into those other agencies, like I said, can happen organically or it can happen inorganically and through acquisition. So let's move to the next slide, which I wanna just talk through recommendations for growth. And I'm gonna lay out, obviously, the I talked a little bit about acquisition, but I'm gonna kinda of lay out the strategy for acquisition. And then we're gonna talk about some additional strategies um, that you can use to get into different agencies or get past performance in certain NAICS codes. So earlier I mentioned on average 73% of work goes to the incumbent. Um, it is a lot more in certain agencies. So acquisition is a great tool that folks don't always think about, but it should be something that is in the toolbox. It might not be used ever, or it, you know, you might decide to use it as you contemplate trying to win new work, get into an agency, or you might work with a contractor or a prime and you might be their sub and they might be looking to retire. And what's important to think about if they're an SDVOSB with SDVOSB set aside and you're an SDVOSB, you could buy that company. Um, it, it's often harder for small businesses to think about an exit strategy because if you have a small business set aside, if you have small business set aside, you generally aren't going to be able to sell to a large company. So your exit is either you let the contracts run out or you sell to a company that has similar or the same certifications and can take over those contracts. And so I think it's important as folks contemplate not only their entry into the marketplace, they also think about their exit. And at Live Oak Bank, that's something that we take very seriously. We work with um, companies who think that they might want to exit, whether it's they need to retire or they, you know, might have a health issue or they just want to know the purchase price of their company. They might not be ready to sell, but they might be getting their company to a place where they could sell in five years, but they're trying to figure out what the valuation might be and when they could sell. So we work with companies, we do free purchase price, um, estimates for you know any company who might be looking to exit at some point and then we also work with companies um, small businesses who might want to buy to acquire and we pre-qualify those companies to acquire um, and so something that's really important to us is looking at where there could be opportunities um, and this is just kind of an example something that we do at live oak is we leverage the sba loan guarantee program, the 7A loan guarantee program. And I'll talk a little bit about the bank in a minute. Um, this is just an overview of a deal. Um, we look at companies with about 15 million in revenue. This is just an example. Um, 2.7 million in EBITDA. And we had about a 50, an 8.5 million purchase price for this particular company. I will say, and let me just, you can look at this example, but I wanna give you some pointers when we look at, you know, the purchase price of a particular company. Generally in the marketplace, we look at the EBITDA, we, we understand better how, 
you know, people throw around the EBITDA number a lot, but we kind of calculate what the EBITDA looks like based on a couple of questions that we can ask a potential seller. And then in the marketplace, specifically, usually in the 541 NAICS code space, we're looking at anywhere from two to four or five times EBITDA is what you'll find in a purchase price. And it, so it really depends on the type of work the company is doing. They could be a high revenue company with low margins. And so the purchase price might seem small given the revenues of that particular company. Um, so we look very closely to kind of figure out you know, are the comp are the contracts set aside? Are they small business set aside? Are they 8A set aside? Are they SDVOSB set aside? How easy could this transaction be? And each, you know, each of those different um, groups, you know, it, it can be a little bit different. Um, and then we also look at the type of work. Obviously, you know, work in high demand right now is cybersecurity. Um, you know, work within the Intel community um, is, is in high demand. So we kind of look at, what the multiple could be on that potential work, how many years are left on particular contracts as well. Um, and then we can contemplate what a purchase price might be based on what we're seeing in the financials. And then we also leverage and look at FPDS um, and prime contract data that we have access to, that everyone has access to, it's publicly available. Um, and we can help determine what that purchase price estimate might be. And then we work with companies who are interested in potentially buying and acquiring to see growth. To, and, I, and I say sometimes the acquisition can help you buy, you know, five or 10 years of organic growth if it's the right fit. Um, so we pre-qualify folks who can buy some of these companies that are similarly situated. Um, and we support that transaction, leveraging things like the SBA 7A uh, program. And the 7A loan, um, and it, it, it is laid out here in this example, um, there's a max of $5 million on the SBA 7A loan. Um, and so if the purchase price is higher, which it is in this case, we would do um, a conventional, a pair of loan on top of that SBA 7A loan to help cover the purchase price that you know has been agreed upon by the buyer and the seller. We get engaged, and I get this question a lot too, um, earlier in the process because I think it's important for the seller to know that they have a pre-qualified buyer because anyone can do an LOI, um, but sometimes the LOI might happen and then the seller finds out that the buyer doesn't have the financing to support the transaction. In addition, from the buy side, we do a lot of due diligence on the contracts to better understand you know, how much life they have on them, what type of contracts, what type of vehicles. So that we're looking at the facts, the data, the contracts that are there to help determine what that purchase price should be. And we do this, and I wanna go, um, I'll talk a little bit, we do this because we leverage our government contracting experts. And so we have um, Jackie Robinson Burnett, who is you know, our rock star in the space. Uh, she was the former um, uh, high-ranking SES at SBA in charge of government contracting. She was formerly the head of the small business office at the Department of the Army, um, at the Army Corps of Engineering, and she also was a contracting officer. We also have former contracting officers from different parts of the federal government. So we really look at the asset. Um, we understand what those contracts look like, what they're gonna do, what, what's you know, on paper, and then also we can validate with a public, um, publicly available data. So we leverage that network. So let's go ahead and move. So acquisition is one piece um, that is a great tool if you're looking to grow pretty quickly. Another thing to keep in mind if you go to the next slide is leveraging financing um, for the right reasons. So oftentimes folks keep their cash on hand to cover payroll and other things or they think they're going to, they're anticipating a large win and they want to keep cash on the books to help mobilize on that large win. I think what we really believe at, at, at Live Oak, um, we look for businesses who are set for significant growth, um, who, you know, could win a $5 million contract tomorrow and, and, and they need to mobilize and it, you know, they could go from 1 million in revenues to five, six, seven million in revenues overnight. So, 
Um, we strongly believe, um, and I think you can talk to a lot of folks in the financial side of things, you need to leverage your cash for the right thing. So your cash should be used for growth. Um, and so something else that we provide that we feel very strongly about is supporting companies as they mobilize. Keep your cash to acquire, um, to do other things that are going to go create growth for you. And then when it comes to covering payroll or hiring folks on a new contract, look at things like mobilization financing. And that's something else that we have provided as a bank. Um, it's similar and solves for the same challenge that factoring solves for. So it's leveraging more short-term financing tools out there to cover that short-term need that you might have as you're experiencing significant growth. And I think that slide's not up right now, but I can kind of talk a little bit about that and obviously answer questions about that. Um, but it allows you to then keep money that you might have um, on the books that you've been holding to just move from, you know, contract to contract and, and respond to a new contract, it allows you um, to use that cash um, for things like acquisition or other growth-oriented activities. So that's the mobilization growth. And then something else to contemplate, and I'm not going to go too much into this, but I think something else that we think is an important, if you go to the next slide, is just leveraging things like the mentor um, protege programs, and there's the SBA program, and then there's the DOD program. And so that's the next slide. Um, and you can, you can decide what works best for you. We definitely work with different companies who are contemplating the mentor protege program. Um, and we can talk through, you know, SBA versus DOD. And I'm sure a lot of folks on the call today are leveraging this type of um, program for organic growth. If you can go to the next slide, I wanted to just give a little background on the bank, and then I want to turn it over for questions. I'm happy to answer any questions on the acquisition side, on the financing side that could be helpful. Um, so Live Oak Bank, a lot of folks haven't heard of us. Some folks have. Um, we're an FDIC chartered, chartered bank. Um, since this is our inception in 2008, we're actually have surpassed $6 billion. Um, We are the number one SBA lender in the country right now. Um, and $2 billion in new originations just last year. So we are organized, we're a little bit different because we're organized by industry verticals. We only lend in 27 different industries. Government contracting is one of those industries. And we are almost like a specialty finance shop because we have experts, and these are some of our experts here um, that you can see. And we've actually added some additional folks and have another person coming on in January um, with significant contracting back, um, background. But these are folks that have been former contracting officers, have been you know, program managers, have worked on the contracting side. Um, and so I think it's important to understand that you're not only working with you know, just a financing partner, something that we very much believe in, and I think there are a lot of you know, banks that are starting to do this. You need someone that's going to be a partner with you throughout your growth. So. Um, you know, making sure your banker knows what the FAR is, make sure that they understand how the government, you know, pays and when you'll need financing. And then also when and how to contemplate growth. Like, should you do an acquisition? Do you, how do you keep cash to make sure you're ready to do an acquisition when you want to? And how should you, you know, size your line if you have a pipeline that's pretty significant over the course of the next, you know, year? And how do you prepare for that? And I think that's something that we take very seriously, and I know a lot of banks do in the GovCon space, um, but it's something that as a government contractor, you don't need an adversary and your financial partner. What you need is a partner who is going to help you grow. And so we really believe in you know, finding winners, finding companies who are set for significant growth, and then providing different tools that they might need during that you know, continuum of growth, whether it's the acquisition financing, mobilization financing to respond to, you know, a large uh, contract that, you know, you just won, or leveraging programs that are in the marketplace and making introductions um, to other government contractors that can really help and support that growth. So that's a little bit about Live Oak Bank. Um, I think with that, I mean, I, the next slide just goes through some of the agency set-asides. Um, but I think with that, I would love to um, leave some time for questions because I think this is a topic um, that
that, you know, there are a lot of questions in the marketplace. I, I get questions right now, um, you know, what is the acquisition, you know, what's happening in the acquisition space? It seems to be a lot hotter now than it was, you know, five years ago. Is it a seller's market? Um, and just to start out in terms of answering some of those questions, um, I think we have seen folks who are realizing that there is an opportunity to exit and they don't just have to run out on their contracts that they can't sell to a larger prime, that there is a marketplace for small businesses selling to small businesses, you know, continuing the culture of that small business, ensuring that those contracts are continuing, um, and then making sure that a business owner can exit um, and retire if they want to and walk away with, um, you know, a lot of, you know, they, they can get back, you know, kind of what they've put into that business. And at the same time, um, on the acquisition side, it allows a lot of small businesses, um, and especially those of the phone veterans, you know, SDVOSBs who are eager and interested in growing and accelerating their growth in the contracting space, in the federal government contracting space, to get that past performance um, and to gain sort of traction a little bit more quickly through that inorganic growth option. So with that, um, I will end there and I will turn it over to questions. Erin, can you see the questions on the uh, screen? I if not, not, I'd be happy to read them. Yes, I cannot see them. So if you could read them okay. that way. Okay, want. so some of the questions um, that we're seeing here. Um, it, in the beginning, you mentioned some of the stats for SBA, USDA, HHS, but one of the participants was wondering if, um, but what are they for DOD and VA? And that was in reference, I believe, to the um, incumbency. So, um, yeah, so, so the stats I had there were SBA, USDA, and HHS for general um, small business set aside. And then I had the stats for DOD for the 8A program, but I am absolutely happy to provide that. I don't have that in front of me, um, but mm -hmm. I can tell you the incumbency, it's 94% if you're within the 8A program and you're incumbent, 94% of the time the work is going to go to that 8A incumbent versus a new a contractor. In terms of general, um, general incumbency rates, like I said, it's about 54 to 77 percent within the federal government. DOG, mm -hmm. I'm happy to pull the exact one for that agency and send it to oh, the participant. That'd be great. And the VA, and we can send that out to the uh, participants yep. as a follow-up. That'd be great. And, and we'll send you a copy of that. Also, another question that came up, are services within DOD considered other agencies? like the United States Air Force, United States Navy. Um, so um, was wondering how you classify that as uh, our services within DOD considered other agencies and other agencies. So yeah, so DOD encompasses all of the services, um, but we can break it out by service. So we can break it out by each of those as well. Okay. 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 Great. And what dictates the? This is another question here. Um, what dictates uh, those growth indicators you're talking about? Does, uh, for example, um, does Live Oak uh, disqualify companies for mobilization financing based on credit, or do you strictly use the contract as a collateral? Yeah. Great question. So we do use the contract as collateral. Um, we do look uh, at, so generally, let me explain this. So generally, you have a line of credit that's based on your monthly AR. What the, and you, the line of credit, and we do a line of credit, a lot of banks do a line of credit. It's, it's a great tool. Where there is usually a gap in the marketplace and, and where you see factoring and other alternative lenders coming in is when, you're, when you win a new contract and you, your contract is, you know, well exceeds what that monthly AR is because your line is usually sized to that monthly AR. It well exceeds that, but you're not able to increase that line yet because you're not invoicing on the contract. So the mobilization financing will provide you pre-invoice that, you know, financing you need to hire folks before you start work on the contract. And we kind of fund 100% of that up front the first four to six pay periods. We look at the contract. So we're kind of underwriting against the contract. We do, however, look at, you know, credit, you know, credit score, and there are a couple of other indicators. However, term loan versus kind of a short term um, ABL loan, it's, it's a little bit different from a credit box perspective. 
Um, but we do, you know, there are certain things we take into account. And I'm happy to talk through that with an individual um, if they want us to walk through it. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much for that explanation. And, and another, just as a follow on to that, um, wondering if this is only available for federal government contractors, how about those that have state procurement contracts? Is that something that you yes. all entertain? So great question. Um, on the mobilization product, we only are doing that right now on federal government contracts. Um, we can look at a borrowing base um, with state, commercial, and federal mix on our line of credit, but the mobilization right now, um, and hope that will hopefully change in the future, is just tied to the federal government contract. Okay, good to know, good to know. And, and this is another great question, and I know this is something that, um, that you're very much aware of. But, you know, before a company, this is the question, before a company gets pre-qualified with uh, Live Oak for a potential acquisition, how can a company see what qualified sellers, what, what qualified sellers are available? The intent yeah, no. would be to see if there's even a company that's looking to buy or interested in buying before you go through those qualification process. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So, so we do the pre-qualification process because generally there are sometimes, it, there are companies that are on the market you know, they're right now to sell. There are some who are contemplating it that aren't sure. And so there's not like a list of these are all the companies that are for sale right now. Because to be honest, it's not like there are a ton of them. We try to work with those. We try to make ourselves aware of those that are selling. So if we see a match with one of our pre-qualified buyers, we can bring that to their attention. You know, we look at size of the buyer. Um, are they able to buy? Like, are they buying a company that is, you know, if, if their company, you know, is four million in revenues and they're buying a company that is 14 million in the 541611 NAICS code, like that transaction, most likely depending on what they're trailing now, five years, um, are like it, it would not work. So we we like to pre-qualify because we know the qualifications of the company, and then we're able to help per, put in front of them companies that they would be able to buy based on size, based on money they're able to bring into a transaction. So there isn't a database where there are a lot of companies for sale. Um, generally, the marketplace, you know, there are M&A advisors um, that are selling, um, representing sellers and buyers, and those transactions kind of happen, sometimes word of mouth. Um, but we try to help, you know, the way we can do it is we pre-qualify folks. We have a good idea of what you're looking for. We, you know, we also kind of have an idea of what they're looking for, but we also understand what they're able to bring to the table. And then what they could purchase, and we can bring potential sellers that we know of um, or are aware of to, to, you know, in front of those pre-qualified buyers. I don't know if there are any other questions. Yeah, there's um, a couple more. Um, one of them was, you know, if they needed to acquire, um, it says, you, you assist, do you assist the entrepreneur to acquire with raising the 10% needed to supplement the 7A loan? Um, if I am an 8A company, I know I need to be careful also bringing a non-8A personnel and investors. Um, but So it's sort of a two-part um, in terms yeah. of how do they, you know, do you assist in that 10% needed to supplement? Generally, we like to see, and I think any bank will say, I mean, you want to see some skin in the game from the buyer. So we like to say at least at a minimum about $150,000 that a buyer would be able to bring to the table from their company or personally. Um, obviously, if it's more, they're probably going to be able to buy a bit of a bigger company. Um, but then we can help make introductions if there are equity investors that they can pair it with. We do have relationships where we can make introductions. Um, where they can help with the financing need in terms of that cash down requirement. Um, in those situations, the equity, the person who's going to provide that, help to provide that cash, that upfront cash need, they would not have more than, you know, a 10 or 9.5% ownership stake. So there would be no, you know, management board position, nothing. Um, it's just essentially cash upfront. Um, as a part of the transaction. Something to keep in mind if you are an 8A company, if you buy an exiting 8A, there is a waiver process um, that can take some time. 
Um, it need, there's a waiver required by the administrator of the SBA. So those transactions can take more time. If you're an 8A company and you're buying a non-8A company, um, it, it's a little bit faster and easier. Um, and we walk through that. Jackie um, Robinson Burnett, who I mentioned, used to actually run the 8A program as well as all the other things that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so she's very um, well versed in, in those regulations and kind of what's allowable. Okay, that's great. And another question we have time, and there's some great questions coming in. I think that would help most people listening in. Um, here's one that says, We are a new startup. How would we go about looking for an acquisition? Yep. Um, Is so, that as a new you can startup, yeah, so as a new startup, there are obviously folks that you can work with in the marketplace. There are buy side advisors that can be of help. If you decide to do it on your own, um, you know, there's the FPDS data. We can also provide um, some support. Um, but something to keep in mind that, that we look for at the bank is ensuring that you have some experience either running a P&L or you've been in the government contracting space and you know it very well. So there are some, as a part of the pre-qualification process, those are some things that we definitely look at. And then as you're starting to contemplate, you know, what to acquire and how to acquire, I think it's getting pre-qualified, understanding how much money you're willing to put in, ensuring that you kind of have the expertise for the targets that you're looking for. And if you don't, bringing in a partner that might have, you know, part ownership over the acquisition that you're doing that can kind of help balance your weaknesses on, you know, on that particular transaction. That's great. Uh, another question, and we do have time, and, and this is one that I, I um, would love to know as well. Do you need contract information? Um, I mean, do you need contract experience to get into to an acquisition? So I would say yes. Like it's important for us. If, if you've run a P&L and you've run a company and you have a little bit of contract experience, but that hasn't been your whole career, or it, you feel like that's an area where you're a little bit weaker, bringing in, like I mentioned, a partner as a part of that you know, acquisition who has done a lot in the contracting space can be a really helpful um, way to sort of balance your, you know, lack of experience potentially in the contracting space. So we do like to see some experience because it is, as a bank, we're putting millions of dollars into a transaction. And so we're putting, we're betting on a CEO. I also like to kind of say we're almost like a venture company without taking equity. We like to pick winners, so we find folks who have the right, you know, acumen, um, whether it's running a business or whether it's really getting contracting, and we know they're going to be able to take this company to the next level. And so it's providing them with that debt, um, and we, it, it, and it's, it's, it's a good, you know, it's a great opportunity, um, and we leverage things like conventional loans, and then we also leverage the SBA 7A loans. So there are a lot of different. Um, structures that we can look at when we talk about the acquisition as well. That's great. Um, here's another one. I'm a new, I'm a new 8A company. Um, do you have um, access to companies that are looking to partner with new 8As with lots, you know, with time left in their program? How can we make introductions? Do, is it something they could reach out to you to get more information if they're a yeah. new 8A? Yes, actually, please reach out to me. I will put you in untouch. Um, Jackie Robinson Burnett actually works with companies in this space, and she can help make those introductions. She has some services that she provides um, as a part of the bank, and I'm happy to send you information on some of the advisory support that she can provide to companies who might be new to the program and looking to participate in a mentor-protege you know, relationship or, you know, identifying, you know, opportunities that, you know, understanding the OASIS on-ramp um, process, those types of things she can be incredibly helpful with. Okay. Um, here's a good question. What's the timeline? Um, you know, what should people anticipate um, in terms of, start, you know, from beginning to end um, with, with this journey if they were looking to do an acquisition of a company? Yes, I get this question a lot. And so it's dependent on the bank, but it's also dependent on the buyer. So I will say that generally speaking, um, finding the target takes the longest time. I joke that sometimes it's like buying a house in certain marketplaces, like the DC marketplace. It can you're not gonna find the perfect house and it can take a long time to find it and you just have to be patient. 
Um, and it's similar when you're looking for a business. And so that process can take on average anywhere from a few months to like a year to a year, sometimes, you know, average of six to eight months. And that's if you start out with no acquisition targets. Sometimes we have folks that come to us who are in, you know, close to a letter of intent or an LOI. They have a target. They might have subbed for, like I mentioned, they could have been the subcontractor for the prime that they might be buying. It just, you know, they have, they have a relationship with the company. That can shorten the timeline a little bit. I like to say, so once we get the letter of intent and we get all of the documents from the buyer and the seller, and that's every document, it's a six week process. But those documents, um, you know, it takes time to get from the seller and it takes time to get from the buyer. So it really is, once we have the documentation, it's pretty quick on our end. Um, we bring in our credit officer right away. We bring in our underwriter right away. Um, we introduce the borrower um, to the team. So if there are questions even, you know, prior to going in a, into underwriting, we get those answered very quickly. Um, we like to problem solve and we don't like to waste anyone's time, especially the business owner. And we don't like to waste our time either. So it's like, let's get the questions out ahead of time and let's bring all parties. You know, a bank, it's not like a black box where you put, you know, something in and then six months later, a yes or a no pops out. It should be a back and forth process where we can get answers up front. So I would say the acquisition, and I get this, because some people say I'm contemplating an acquisition in 2019, and my answer to them is you should start now then, because if you start now, that acquisition, you might not be moving or closing on that acquisition until next summer. Um, if you have a target that you bring to us, it could be a little quicker, but it's just important to understand that, you know, it, you don't want to rush the process, but you also, I think our incentive is in line with the small business as well. You want to move as quickly as possible. So ensuring that you're organized, you have your documents in place, are going, it's only going to help the process. And it's in our best interest as a bank to make sure we're as efficient and fast as possible. Similar, I'm sure, to the small business owner too, when it comes to just the processing of things. Oh, that's great. That's great information. And then uh, the, one of the slides that we had up towards the end, it was the set aside slide, Aaron. Um, and one of the questions was, I guess it didn't note, what was the fiscal year for the agency set aside? I didn't know. Um, I'm looking at it here. There's oh, no yeah, indicator. And that was just a question. Yes, this is 2017. Okay, so it's current, yeah, because we haven't really seen 2018 numbers come through yeah, and their completion yet. Okay. Okay, um, let me see if there's any have come in anymore. It, um, I know a lot of the questions have been, um, am I going to have access to um, the slides and the audio? And the answer is yes. Shortly after this presentation, we'll be uh, posting it on our website. We have a library on the VIP website that you, anybody can access under resources and you'll be able to find the audio and the PowerPoint slides there. Um, it does take us a little bit of time to um, download um, from the system, but if not today, first thing in the morning. Everybody wants to know how to reach Erin. Um, we have the last slide up with her contact information. She, um, They just went through a, a reorg of a bit with new email, but she'll be getting her old one for a while, but we will send an updated email, but that one is certainly good for, you know, it will, it will find Erin. Uh, um, and that's one way that you can go ahead. And the new one, and the new one just so it's Aaron dot Andrew at liveoak dot bank. So Aaron E R I N dot A N D R E W at liveoak and it's just dot bank. Just I want to in case folks want to email today. I'm happy. I will. I will get okay, back. Okay. Dot bank. Okay. Versus liveoakbank dot com. Okay. Okay. Great. So that would just happen, which is exciting. But uh, so we'll make sure we get that out and um, as well to everyone. Um, then there's also this one last question here. Also, do you have any recommendations for a 541 NACE code? What is the best way to get a line of credit for a startup as well? So a line of credit, so um, on a 541 NACE code, if it's a startup, generally it's going to be, like I mentioned, um, you probably can get you know, an SBA Express loan if it's under $350,000. The line generally is going to be size to your monthly AR. Um, and I get this, you know, you get this question a lot. Um, and what I would recommend, so we don't do deposits as a bank, and I get this question a lot. 
Um, we are in the process of doing that and eventually we will. I would contact your local bank um, where you have a deposits relationship. And if you need a small line of credit, that's probably the best institution to work with. You're gonna get a great rate. They're gonna have your deposits. They're gonna have known and work with you. Um, and then once you're ready for us, and generally when you're ready for us, it's usually after you have at least monthly AR above $150,000. Um, and then we can kind of help to transition you because you need you know, someone that can help provide a product when you're jumping in terms of revenues pretty quickly. So you might need mobilization or you need a line that's above what your current bank is willing to do just from a risk profile, um, just not knowing the GovCon space. So it, I think it's a couple of different things. And I think the SBA, i a huge fan, obviously, I used to work there, but I think the SBA does amazing work. Um, contact your local SBA um, uh, district office, um, work, you know, with folks like the VIP program, our VIP, because they can help, you know, put you in touch with the right folks um, and, and, and get to know your local bank in terms of very small startup. But then let's have a conversation because I think as you start to grow in this space, you absolutely um, are going to be ready for us and we're going to be excited to work with you, especially if you're in the process of really looking towards, you know, significant growth over the course of the next few years. Oh, that's great. And a couple of people have asked, and so I just want to put that out there, and I don't know if this is something that you can, you know, put a generalization on, but they're wondering about the fees, the fee structure, um, and how that works, you know, with understanding that there's a lot of uh, time and expertise that goes into putting these deals together and the financing. How does that work at Live Oak Bank, and, and how do they find out that information? Yeah, please contact me. Obviously, it depends on the product and the type of need the risk profile of the borrower, but we're happy to walk through that. I will say, you know, we're an FDIC regulated bank, so we don't have to borrow our money. We, you know, we have, you know, we're banks, so we have the money um, available to us. So the rates are very competitive when you're looking at the mobilization um, product. Um, the SBA product, we're within the, con you know, th there are limits within the SBA program on what can be charged, and we are absolutely well within those. So I'm happy to kind of walk through those um, for anyone that has questions on a particular product. Just feel free to, to email me at erin.andrew at liveoak.bank. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you, Erin, uh, again for your excellent presentation on how to leverage an acquisition to accelerate growth. Um, and thank you to our participants for attending the VIP webinar, webinar and to SBA for making this webinar possible. I know I learned a lot in this presentation and I hope you found the information presented to be helpful to you as you prepare your company for continued growth in the federal marketplace. Um, as I mentioned, um, all questions um, might, may not have been answered due to this, the time, um, but certainly any questions that we didn't get to, we'll ask Aaron to, to respond to and we'll meet, email them all out to the uh, participants. I would also like to ask that you just take a moment to complete the very short survey that will be sent to you immediately following this program. Um, your feedback is very important to us. And uh, finally, thank you and I wish you all continued success in your business and wishing you all a wonderful holiday season. Thank you again, Erin, and thank you. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you.